Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brethren in Christ, let us to Jesus Christus. Welcome to the Meaning of Catholic. My name is Timothy S. Flanders, and today we're going to talk about the spirit of Vatican I. Uh, before we do this, this is sh premiering on Thursday, which is the day before the March for Life. So um, make sure that you say some prayers for the March for Life, for the success of the March for Life, for all those involved, for safety. Uh, I know there's a lot of kids out there. My own kid will be there. Um, so please say a prayer for the safety of everyone involved. If you recall, last year there was the controversy involving Nick Sandman, who was uh, basically surrounded by Indian protesters and the black Hebrews and various groups. And the media spin on that uh, created this defamation campaign, which just had threatened to ruin this young man's life. Um, but it turned out that all of this was false after they reviewed further video footage. And Nick Sandman had, has just actually won his first case. He, uh, CNN settled with him for some $25 million over this. So um, the, the uh, liberal, communist, whatever machine is uh, virulently opposed to this march. And it's very important that we pray for all of our kids who are over there and uh, the success of this march is a very large march. Um, we've been very blessed in America to have our president and the vice president to recognize this march, and I believe it's the very first president who has recognized it ever. So it's a very large protest, I believe perhaps the, the largest in our country, regular protest. So let's all pray for the success of the March for Life. Um, I wanted to address one question from a patron uh, who had asked, about how can the church be holy with all of um, the the sin of all the members and the hierarchy and everything? Um, well, the the uh, what do you want to do when you ask things like that? So, I mean, in the, in the creed, we we believe uh, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So, there's one. There's the mar four marks of the church: one holy Catholic and apostolic. So, what you want to do is pull out your uh, Ludwig Ott. And he's going to tell us about what does it mean that the church is holy. Um, so it, he says that the church is holy in her origin, her purpose, her means, and her fruits. So he discusses that. So the, obviously the origin is the founder, our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that's what makes the first origin, the first reason that the church is holy, is the founding of the church by Jesus Christ himself. Um, and also in her inner life principle, which is the Holy Ghost. Uh, in her purpose, which is the glory of God and the sanctification of men, and in the means by which she attains that purpose, in the teaching of Christ with its propositions of faith, commandments, and counsels concerning morals, in her liturgy, especially the holy sacrifice of the Mass, in her laws, in her institutions, such as the orders and congregations, the institutions of education and of charity, in the sacraments, the sacramentals, and the liturgical prayers, the gifts of grace, and the charisms given by the Holy Spirit. So those are the, the origin, the purpose, and the means. And the fruits, then, are the members. Now, first, we, we need to distinguish between the church triumphant, the church suffering, and the church militant. And really, most of the church is triumphant or suffering. So, And both of them are saints. Even the, the, the souls in purgatory are called the holy souls because they are destined to eternal life. And they are just enduring a, a purification. So they are holy in the sense that they are destined to the eternal life and they will be holy in the afterlife. So they will go to heaven. So most of the church is in fact holy in her members as well. So that is the fruits of those means of sanctification. Um, so then Ott goes on and just says that many members of the church are holy in the ordinary sense of holiness. That is the state of grace. So here's another very important um, aspect of that is that the state of grace is the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity. And that is a state of holiness. Even, it, it, even when we talk about holiness, we often think of just the extraordinary holiness of the saints, but there's also just simply the ordinary holiness of a state of grace. And so that is an ex still a, an extraordinary state. Um, 
because it's the, the state of grace is the charity of God, the divine nature of God shared with us. We are temples of the Holy Ghost. We receive the blessed sacrament, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ within us. And that is incredible. That is an amazing gift. And that is ordinary holiness. That's ordinary holiness. So that, uh, and in the, the language of the New Testament, calls ordinary Christians saints. And so there is also the sense of the ordinary holiness of just everyday faithful. And so the everyday faithful, just a normal Catholic in a state of grace, maintaining his state of grace, if he falls into mortal sin, God forbid, he goes to confession, he restores his state of grace. And so he still has that holiness. So there is the holiness in him by the state of grace. So he may not be an extraordinary saint, but he still has that holiness. So there's still still a great holiness among many of the church. And then, of course, there is the extraordinary holiness of the saints. So the um, obviously the miracles and you know stigmata and all sorts of uh, phenomena that are extraordinary among the saints, certainly. Um, so those are the those are the, the ways that Odd explains the holiness of the church. Now, then we talk about sin in the church sin among the members of the church. Now, Ott discusses how, um, and this is a de fide proposition. So we remember we talked about the the different degrees of certainty. So de fide is the the most certain proposition. So this is something that we must believe on pain of mortal sin, on the pain of mortal sin of heresy. So we must believe this. Now, this is the de fide proposition from Ott. Um, And this, in the Baronius edition, this is um, page 327. So he says, not only those members who are holy, but sinners also belong to the church. Now, this is a very important point here because um, what he goes on to say is that there are three types of sin which actually do cut a member from the church, and that is schism, heresy, and apostasy. So in those cases, there are actually sins either against charity in the case of schism or against the faith in the case of heresy and apostasy, which actually do cut one off from the body of Christ. You are no longer a Christian. You are no longer a Catholic. uh, You are no longer part of the church in those cases for those sins. Um, So, but not every other sin that is mortal. So if you commit a mortal sin, what happens is that you're destroying charity in your soul. That's the definition of mortal sin is destroying charity. So you have, you have, um, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity in your soul by baptism. And when you sin against charity, you sin against, uh, you have a mortal sin, that destroys charity. So you are bro- your, your bond with God and with the church is broken, but you still retain faith and hope as long as you haven't sinned against them in those sins we mentioned. So you still have Christian faith and Christian hope, and so you are still a part of the church, even if you are in mortal sin in that sense. So you've lost the state of grace, um, but you're still a member of the church. And so that, in that sense, you're still a member of the church. And so um, this, is, this was a uh, controversy, back, going back to St. Augustine, among the, uh, there were the Donatists and other schismatics who believed that if someone committed a mortal sin, they were immediately thrust from the church. And St. Augustine... Uh, maintain the Catholic view that the, the mortal sin did not cut one off from the body of Christ. So the, the difficulty here is that our Lord tells parables. There's a, a various number of parables that, in fact, uh, St. Saint, Saint Augustine uses to argue against the Donatist schismatics. And he says, uh, so there's the, um, the parable of the cockle among the wheat, the net which enmeshes good and bad fish, the wise and the foolish virgins. So, for example, the cockle and the wheat, where our Lord says the kingdom of heaven is as uh, when someone plants uh, wheat in a field and it grows up, but then an enemy comes and plants cockle, which was another grain which looked very similar to the wheat, but it was not wheat. So it, you couldn't eat it. You couldn't. It couldn't be used just as wheat. And then what happens is... Um, the husbandman, he says, uh, what has happened? An enemy has done this. And his servants tell him, do you want us to pull up the cockle? And he says, no, leave the cockle to grow with the wheat until the end of time when 
we will, and then he says, interpreting the parables, he says that angels, uh, our Lord will send the angels to pull up the cockle and burn it while taking the wheat, wheat and putting it into his barn. So our Lord, by his providence, has granted to the church that the sinners among the church will continue in the church until the final judgment, when the final judgment, they will be finally separated. So, and that, that has to do with our bond of charity with our brethren. We need to keep the bond of charity with our brethren, even if they're in mortal sin, we need to keep that charity towards them, always willing good for them and wanting them to be in unity so that they can receive the holy sacraments, receive everlasting life. Now, we may also make want to make a distinction, like I, I discussed, between heresy, schism, and apostasy, because many of the hierarchs, it is unfortunate to say, many of the hierarchs uh, seem to be promoting heretical propositions in, in various ways. And so the difficulty is, as I've discussed in my video on heretical popes, heresy is not only something that's in the mind, but it's also something in the will. And so it's not only an error of judgment, you know, if you're making an error, even if it's a regarding de fide, you may not be actually culpable for that thing if you are not obstinate. So a lot of these bishops, unfortunately, they've just received, um, we've talked about this, the seminary education these days, they don't teach them Prumer, they don't teach them St. Alphonsus, they don't teach them from, you know, these basic textbooks that we talk about. And so they're not even given so much of the faith, so much of the faith of their fathers, the faith of the saints. And they're giving the, this, this kind of wishy-washy 20th century um, doctrines, which are very weak. And so it's not for us to judge exactly what culpability they may be, but we are going to discuss in just a moment how to act. Now, I, I, we tried to talk about the virtue of piety, and we're going to get into that. Because we do owe piety to every bishop. We owe piety to every priest, every cleric, our parents, and especially the sovereign Roman pontiff. So, but what we're going to talk about today is the um, spirit of the First Vatican Council. So, in many ways, this particular issue is really at the root. So... I want to talk about an article that came from um, a blog known as Where Peter Is. Now, this blog defends the pontificate of Pope Francis and attempts to interpret, or in an orthodox manner, all of his ambiguous statements and the difficulties that his words have brought about. So, um, first, I want to say that the virtue of piety does cause us to um, what St. Gregory the Great says, he says, uh, the sons of Noah cover the nakedness of their father. So if we, ever cons if we ever encounter a sin or what appears to be a sin or any sort of issue with our superiors, we want to cover the nakedness of, of them. So we don't want to um, go about uh, publicizing it because that causes scandal. And scandal is an occasion of spiritual ruin for any faithful soul. That's what scandal is. But, as we've discussed, St. Thomas says that when the faith is endangered, we may even need to rebuke a prelate publicly for the sake of the faith. And he discusses when Paul rebuked Peter. So, what I want to talk about is, we've discussed in the heretical Pope video that the church has not de determined and defined how exactly the church is to deal with a heretical pope. Now, this presupposes the fact that there could be a heretical pope. Now, there, this is a very important point because we say that the Roman church is indefectible. We say that the Roman pontiff is infallible on faith and morals when he speaks at, at cathedra. Um, but there, has been, there have been times when the pope has fallen into error or heresy in different ways or different degrees and as a result, um, the, the Pope has, or the, the faith and the faithful have understood that this is a possibility. And this has not actually caused them to sacrifice the faith. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, let me provide a few quotes here. Um, this is from an article I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link from Eric Ibarra 
friend of mine um, that just it's a list of quotations from popes and eminent theologians, which just discusses the possibility of a heretical pope, and which which is means to say that it, this proves the fact that the church has not understood the possibility of a heretical pope, first of all, to be outside of the realm of possibility. It could really happen. But also, even if it did, it did not sacrifice the fundamental faith in the Roman church as indefectible. So um, so here's an example. Adrian II. So this is in the 9th century, the 8th Ecumenical Council. Adrian, the, this is Pope Adrian II. He, he discusses Pope Honorius. Now, we're not, we don't have time to go in all the specifics of Honorius, um, but basically he was anathematized by a, uh, an ecumenical, ecumenical council, and he was confirmed as a heretic for many years. Now, he was at, to be fair to him, he was anathematized after his death. Basically, uh, he said ambiguous things that led to heresy is, is essentially what happened. And so Adrian II, in the 9th century, he says, he, Honorius, had been accused of heresy, which is the only offense where inferiors have the right to resist the initiatives of their superiors or are free to reject their false opinions. So this, so now we have Pope Adrian II discussing the possibility of a heretical pope and the possibility of resisting and disobeying a heretical pope. Pope Adrian, 9th century. So now, now let's move on to Pope Innocent III. He's... This is in the in uh, the year 1198. Now, pope Innocent III, if you don't know him, he's a huge pope in um, what we call the High Middle Ages, um, so-called Middle Ages. I don't like the term because it's pejorative. Um, I like prefer the Christian era, um, but lack of a better term, the so-called High Middle Ages. So Pope Innocent III, he says, truly he, the pope, should not flatter himself about his power. Nor should he rashly glory in his honor and high estate, because the less he is judged by man, the more he is judged by God. Still the less can the Roman pontiff glory because he can be judged by men, or rather can be shown to be already judged if, for example, he should wither away into heresy, because he who does not believe is already judged. End quote. That's from ser sermon number four. And by the way, the first quote from Adrian II, that's from the Acts of Constantinople IV, which was a, an ecumenical council. So that, that quote was from Sermon Number 4 from Pope Innocent III, 1198. So again, another pope discussing the possibility of a heretical pope. Um, there's another pope, I don't recall, I think it was another Hadrian. He said, um, you should always obey my... Uh, my successors unless they preach heresy. Um, so then we let's move to a doctor of the church. We have um, St. Francis de Sales. Um, St. Francis de Sales had um, written in the Catholic controversy. So right now he's trying to convert all these Calvinists back to the faith. And he says in this, in this book, pages 305, 306, he says, we do not say that the Pope cannot err in his private opinions as did John the 22nd or be altogether a heretic as perhaps Honorius it was, end quote. So St. Francis of Sales says that a pope can be a heretic, or he can err in his private opinions. So John the 22nd is a case where Pope John the 22nd erred in his private opinions. He had, a, he had some sermons where he was pushing a doctrine that was erroneous. Um, he was resisted by the faithful, and he later recanted. So, so there was instances where the pope was a heretic, did err in some way, and he was resisted by the faithful. He was resisted by ecumenical councils. And this was confirmed by the church. It was confirmed by popes that the pope can err. The pope can fall into heresy. It's very rare, but these are the times when, as they say, as I've quoted here, the pope can be resisted. Now, this is the reason that in the, uh, in the canon law before 1917, it said, quote, the pope cannot be judged by anyone unless he has been found de deviating from the faith, end quote. That's from Decretum Graziani Prima Pars, um, 40C, chapter 6 and 3. That's, I'm going to link that. That's from um, an essay by Athanasius Snyder. So when we get to, so what we have coming into the 19th centuries, we have a, a strong tradition of the Roman primacy of the, of the Pope, he is the head of the church. He is infallible in faith and morals. And we'll, we'll talk about how that gets worked out. But there is a sense that he can err. Now, 
even when we allow that, the instances of that erring are very, very rare. Probably, if you compare that to any other major see in Christendom, the popes have erred probably least from any other see. And so it is a very rare, I'm going to link another article from Kvasniewski, which he discusses papal lapses. And he even points out that compared to the total number of popes, it's such a rare thing that the pope even errs at all. So it's it, even with the error, we've got to look at the history, even with Pope Francis, even if we're you know, struggling with this crisis, the, whole, the track record of the entire papacy is actually very good. And so that needs to be kept in mind. But what happens in the 19th century? So 19th century, first you have the French and American revolutions in the late 18th century. And then through the 19th century, there's these massive secular revolutions. They're Republican, which means that they are seeking to create a Republican government, a representative government. They're seeking to overthrow the divine right monarchy that had held sway in Europe among the kingdoms for centuries before this. And... So what was happening was a massive revolution in society, and there's a massive amount of secularization. Um, if you read my book, um, this is uh, discussed in, in, in my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible for Traditional Catholics. We go through all the history that, that went on, and there was a, just a massive amount of secularization in society where um, men were doubting the Bible. They were doubting God. They were asserting that society should not give any allegiance to Christ the King, should not give allegiance to the church. And so this was, there was these massive revolutions. And against this, the papacy declared that, they declared the rights of Christ the King, the rights of the church. Um, so in the, sec, in the first Vatican Council, so now we have um, Vatican I. Now the, what we m mostly think about in Vatican I is um, the infallibility of the Roman pontiff, uh, the infallibility of the Pope. That doctrine was defined at Vatican I. So in that doctrine um, was born the spirit of Vatican I. Now, just as we talk about the spirit of Vatican II, an even more deadly spirit is the spirit of Vatican I. Before we get into the First Vatican Council, the other important thing to remember is this. The Pope, before this time very rarely spoke to the universal church. And this cannot be overstated. We live in a time when the Pope is constantly speaking. Because first of all, we have, we have technology. We can see what he's talking about in every single homily that he gives every day. Um, but also the Pope is actually putting out encyclicals all the time. Every few, every year, there's another encyclical, apostolic exhortation. The Pope is constantly speaking to the universal church. Now, we have to emphasize the fact that this is a very rare thing in history. We are living in a very strange time where the Pope is doing this all the time. So before this, we, we could really say Leo the eight, Leo the um, 13th is really the big one. But even before that, you have um, Pius VI, who writes Actorum Fidei, which is a, an encyclical I believe the first encyclical was the late 18th century, but after you have Gregory the 16th and really Pius the 9th starts to uh, make a ton of encyclicals, but Leo the 13th starts to, he, he writes a ton of encyclicals. Um, I think five a year. I did the math once, but I, I don't recall exactly. But um, so the key thing here is that the Pope becomes a universal teacher. Now the Pope was always a universal teacher, but he, his role was much more restricted to, one, giving official responses to questions that were posed to him. And these questions were only dubious things, doubtful matters, the dubia um, that were submitted to him. Or he was really interacting with emergencies. So when there are emergency situations between kings and crusaders and things of that nature, the pope would intervene. So, but the pope was not functioning as a universal teacher. Well, what did Catholics do for 1,800 years? Well, they just knew the faith. They, they were taught the faith by their parents. They worked on, out their salvation in the faith. Um, there's a great article I'm going to link from Eric Sammons that talks about the new papala, uh, papalotters, if I can say that word. But it's basically everything revolves around the Pope. 
and that's what we're going to get into. So this is the spirit of Vatican I. The spirit of Vatican I is basically a misinterpretation of Vatican I, wherein the Pope just becomes the central, uh, central force of the whole church, where everybody's just looking to the Pope always to know what the faith is. And we can't even really trust our own reason. We don't even know what A plus B equals it is. We have to look to the Pope always. And that is the spirit of Vatican I. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. So we, we talked about the revolutions, the... Um, the revolutions in society, and these really were really the mer- worst that the, that the church had ever seen, and that provoked such a strong response in Vatican I, which was necessary to deal with it. In fact, the revolutionary army of Italy stopped the council. They were uh, besieging Rome during the council, and they finally broke through and stopped the council. That was how bad it was. They barely got two documents released in Vatican I to finish it, um, and they didn't even finish it. Vatican I was not officially closed until Vatican II. So you have uh, the first Vatican Council. Now, what does the document actually say? The document says that in a very restricted sense, the Pope is infallible in his official pronouncements, ex cathedra to the universal church, intending to bind the whole church to faith and morals. And so this restricts it to a very rare instance Some say there's only been two ex cathedra statements. I don't know where that comes from. Uh, Based on the criteria in the the council, there's been many, many, many infallible statements. Um, So I don't don't really know where that comes from exactly. But um, the the point is the the church is infallible herself. And so the church, when the pope is functioning for the church, the church, he is infallible for the church. And in the same way, the ecumenical council is infallible. The consensus of the faithful is infallible. The consensus of the fathers, consensus of the scholastics, um, the consensus of prior papal pronouncements. There's all uh, these other sources of infallibility, as we said. Most people did not uh, function by looking at the Pope all the time as a universal teacher. That was the innovation. That was the change, that really the change that happened with Vatican I. Now, let's emphasize the fact that the Pope was responding to the emergency of the secular, secular revolutions. And so he's responding to an emergency. Desperate times call for desperate measures. So it's not unfit that the church should, or the Pope should become a universal teacher. Not necess- it's not necessarily wrong, because obviously, you know, we, we love the encyclicals of, of uh, you know, Leo the Thirteenth and obviously Pius X. You know, there's many great encyclicals, but the, the faith should not revolve around the Pope. Because the Pope is the universal teacher in an extraordinary sense. Meaning extraordinary, meaning rare, meaning emergency times, then the Pope functions like that. But... We, sh- we need to have the tradition as that bedrock, that the, the basic faith, basic tenets. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let me give you some more quotes. Now, we talk about um, the spirit of Vatican I. So this is a quote from Vatican I, which, which kind of goes into this. It says, For the Holy Spirit was promised to the successors of Peter, not so that they might, by his revelation, make known some new doctrine, but that, by his assistance, they might religiously guard and faithfully expound the revelation or deposit of faith transmitted by the apostles, end quote. So there's, there's a very strong distinction being made here between revelation, which is something that's sort of ex nihilo, it's out of nothing, it's, it's sort of created by God, in a sense, um, in the sense that it is a revelation, it's something new, it's something that could, um, in, in one sense, contradict what came before, for example, the revelation of St. Peter to abrogate the Mosaic Law to baptize Cornelius. So this is a revelation, something that's really brand new to that time. The Pope does not receive new revelation. He is bound by the tradition to be its servant. There is actually a passage in, uh, um, in Vatican II, in uh, Dei Verbum, which is very good, which talks about how the magisterium is not above the Word of God, meaning the Scripture and the tradition, the magisterium is not above the word of God, but its servant. And so the magisterium, the Pope, is here to interpret what has been handed down to us. Now, we didn't have time to go into 
further quotes, there's the quotes of the, uh, the papal oath, where the Pope made an oath to guard the tradition, to always guard the tradition. So Vatican I says, to religiously guard and faithfully expound the revelu- revelation. So the Pope is the servant of the tradition. So who's the real authority in the church? The real authority is tradition. That is the authority of the church. That's where all the authority comes from. And the Pope is its guardian. The Pope's job is to guard that tradition, to make sure that it continues to be passed down from generation to generation without spot, without error, without alteration of any kind. Now, we don't have time to go into development of doctrine because there are material changes in the sense that there are formulations that are changes, um, but there are not changes in terms of new revelation. So, so what the Pope responded to the spirit of Vatican I. So what happened was immediately the Vatican I, now to be fair, like I said, the Italian army stopped Vatican I, shut it down, and so they didn't really have time. They could not actually do any further pronouncing or dogmatizing and that type of thing. So whatever deficiency may be even in Vatican I, because they didn't have time, they couldn't finish it, is there because the Italian army stopped it. So, but what happened was, immediately what happened, they begin to interpret this as the spirit of Vatican I, wherein the Pope is the absolute monarch over the word of God. He is there to create new revolution, revelation. He can just arbitrarily say whatever he wants to. He doesn't have to be bound by tradition. He can contradict tradition. That was the interpretation that was coming out of Vatican I immediately. So, so the so for example, in the in Sw- the Swiss bishops um, published in reaction to this spread of this spirit of Vatican I. So pastoral instruction 1871, and he says that they say that it in no way depends upon the caprice of the Pope or upon his good pleasure to make such and such a doctrine the object of a dogmatic definition. He is tied up and limited to the divine revelation and to the truths which that revelation contains. He is tied up and limited by the creeds already in existence and by the preceding definitions of the church. He is tied up and limited by the divine law and by the constitution of the church. And that's from a book by Dom Cuthbert Butler, The Vatican Council, page 464. So then um, this author recounts how blessed Pius the, the IX, the Pope, confirms this. He confirms that this is, in fact, the teaching of Vatican I. And he says, um, nothing could be more opportune or more worthy of praise or cause the truth to stand out more clearly. So he's confirming that the Swiss bishops just said. He's saying this is not about the Pope just being a monarch in the sense that he can just say fiat this, fiat that, um, and contradict tradition. No, he, he is bound by all of these things. He's very limited. He's, in fact, probably more limited than any other Christian to even say anything because he is not permitted, doesn't have enough authority to contradict tradition. So, so this is what Pius the, the IX confirms um, for the Swiss bishops. And then even further, then you have the, the German bishops um, do a similar thing in 1875. Um, so the German bishops also confirm that the Pope is not the absolute monarch in the sense that he has power over the tradition. He's still bound to the tradition. And then, again, Pius IX defended this reaction of the German episcopate in, and this is from uh, uh, Gerhard Müller from his article in First Things, By What Authority? And he discusses how um, he defended the German bishops in their, re- re- their refutation of this false interpretation of the spirit of Vatican I. They said that, quote, the opinion according to which the Pope is an absolute sovereign because of infallibility is based on a completely false understanding of the dogma of infallibility. And then moreover, they added, uh, the Pope's magisterium is restricted to the constants of holy scripture and tradition and also to the dogmas previously defined by the teaching authority of the church, end quote. And so once again, Pius IX confirms this interpretation. This is, this is in the minds of the bishops at the time. They understood that um, this was not that the, the Pope could just do whatever he pleased. He was restricted to the tradition, to passing down the tradition, to guarding the tradition. So, 
So this is what we have, um, the spirit of Vatican I. Um, nevertheless, because of this doctrine being disseminated down into the minds of the faithful, there began to be such a strong push. And this also, by the way, this was the time where technology was allowing the faithful to see the Pope more than ever before, to read his words more than ever before. So you had the newspaper, you know, you were printing pictures of the Pope, his writings and that type of thing, more than any before in, in the history of the church. You know, before this, no one even, I mean, before this, our fathers, before this time, couldn't even name who was the Pope. They, they didn't, they had no idea who, who, what his name was, what he looked like, what he was saying. They had no idea. That's because this, this was the time when, so the spirit of Vatican I begins where um, instead of the tradition being passed down from father to father, father to son, um, then you just have all the faithful just revolving around the Pope. Whatever the Pope says, we do. Whatever the Pope says, we do. Now, once again, to be fair, the, the point is that we, we, I mean, we should be submissive to the Pope. Um, but we be, when he becomes a universal teacher, that is for the sake of this emergency. You know, this is not the normal way of things, the normal way of Catholicism. And that's what has been uh, ob obtaining since that time. So Leo the Thirteenth, Pius the Tenth, Pius the Eleventh, Pius the Twelfth, Benedict the Fifteenth. Um, you know, these popes are trying to react to this emergency situation. Pius X in particular is going very strong over the modernists. But what happens in 1917, the Code of Canon Law, that code that I had uh, quoted, which said that the Pope is judged by no one except for heresy, that canon was altered during this time of the Spirit of Vatican I to say the Pope can be judged by no one, period. So now there's no more of this exception for heresy that, as I stated before, was deeply a part of the tradition. So there's always been this exception for heresy among, with, for the Pope. Even when he wasn't a, acting constantly as a universal teacher, there was still this understanding that the Pope could err and could be a heretic and may need to be resisted at that time. So, but because of the spirit of Vatican I, that concept of that exception really faded away. And... Again, to be fair, these popes were trying to deal with modernism. They're trying to deal with all of these dissenting theologians and modernists and heretics who are trying to say that you can just dissent from the pope. Now, as we've tried to discuss in previous videos, because of the virtue of piety, we are to submit religious submission of mind and will to the Holy Father at all times for every reason, unless there is a grave cause. And that is the only reason we could ever resist the Pope. Because we should always have the virtue of piety and humility. We want to obey the Pope. We, we want to obey the Holy Father. We want to love him as the Father and obey him as a Father. But if the Holy Father asked us to sin, we have to disobey that. What can we do? But that's the only grave cause. That's the only time that we can have this, this, this moment. We can't just flippantly... Uh, cast aside the obedience due to the Pope or any cleric. Um, so I want to emphasize, as we've been discussing about the spirit of Vatican I, it's very important that even though the Pope function as, functioning as a universal teacher is a new thing, and we need to be aware and recoup tradition as the primary mode of the faith, we also need to be careful that we don't drift towards the other extreme, because those who are resisting the Roman pontiff, as I've stated um, in, in like the last video, um, we discussed Pope Francis's words regarding Amoris Laetitia. So the, the, basically the situation is the magisterium, really since Vatican II, has allowed things to be said which are vague. A pious man will then submit in dubium and ask the proper authorities, what did you mean by that? That is the that is the essence of piety. We don't just, oh, they're heretics, we're done. That's not, that is not Catholic, it's not pious, it's not humble. The, the method is, if a, something vague or miss, you know, something we don't understand that appears to contradict manifestly what we've been given as Catholics, we must submit uh, a question to the magisterium to clarify. Because out of piety, we want to believe that the magisterium does not err in this, would not be erring, would not be 
you know, saying some, some erroneous proposition. So instead, we, we offer this sort of offer of obedience to the Holy Father, to the Magisterium, and we say, what did you mean by that? So the situation is that the Magisterium has refused to answer. That's the issue. So now that the Magisterium and Pope Francis have refused to answer, now what do we do? Well, we can't submit to something that appears to contradict what we've been given manifestly. Because the Pope is bound to those things. As we've tried to state here in this video, the Pope is bound to tradition. He's bound to scripture. He cannot contradict it. He's bound to it, just as we are. And so if he says something that appears to contradict it, we cannot follow it because we would then be contradicting the tradition. So in piety, we try to clarify, we try to obey, but if Pope Francis does not clarify, if he does not say, I have erred or this must not be understood against tradition or whatever, or clarify it, what are we left with but to follow what we know, what we know for certain to be right? So the, the faithful cannot be bound by ambiguities. We cannot be bound by things that we don't know what they mean. So we can't be bound by that. We can't submit to that. How can we follow something we don't understand? And is through no fault of our own. So, but as I, I'm trying to emphasize, we need to have the piety. We need to maintain this piety for the office. I know that people become angry and hurt by, you know, if Pope Francis is what indicates, what, what indications suggest he's doing, if he really is trying to destroy the faith, um, and he has this malicious will towards the faith, we must still love him because our Lord said to love your enemies. If, if Pope Francis is an enemy of the faith, we must love him because Christ said love your enemies. Are we better than Christ who forgave his crucifiers? No. A servant is not greater than his master. So even if Pope Francis is the worst pope in the whole world, in the whole history of the church, we have to still love him and pray for him. That's what a Christian does, and that's what we're doing to suffer in this time and to even love Pope Francis as the Holy Father, as the Roman Pontiff. So lastly, I want to read a quote from St. Catherine of Siena, because, again, we want to emphasize that we, we want to still maintain the piety for the office and love for the man, even if he may be evil. So these are the words of St. Catherine of Siena to the Pope. He says, or she says, St. Catherine, he's, she says, Very loved and reverend Father in Christ Jesus, I, Katerina, servant and slave of the servants of Jesus Christ, and your poor, wretched, unworthy daughter, am writing to you in his precious blood. I long to see you, the sort of true gentle shepherd, who takes an example from the shepherd Christ, whose place you hold." So she reverences him from the very beginning of her letter with great reverence and great piety. And then she proceeds to call him to a greater obedience. So she's rebuking the sovereign pontiff himself, but she's doing it with great reverence and great piety. And she ends her letter by saying, Forgive my presumption. Let my love and grief for God's honor and the advancement of Holy Church be my excuse in the presence of your kindness. So this is how a saint talks to the Roman pontiff, even a Roman pontiff who may be in error in some way. And so we need to maintain this piety. This is what will maintain us in peace so that we are not overcome by bitterness and resentment because the Lord says, unless you forgive men your sins, your heavenly father will not forgive you. So whatever fault Pope Francis has, we need to still love and forgive him, even if he is sinning against the faith. And we need to recoup the tradition, reject the false spirit of Vatican I, and understand the, the true role of the Holy Father, the true role of the Roman Pontiff, that he is an arbiter, the final arbiter of the faith, but he is not the faith. He is not the church, the, the Catholic faith. The Pope is its arbiter and its guardian. So we need to reject this false spirit of Vatican I, recoup tradition as the one authority, so I want to thank all my patrons. Um, once again, you can get this, uh, my book, uh, Introduction to the Holy Bible for Traditional Catholics. Um, all patrons get the free PDF, but you can buy it on Amazon. 
Um, but so lastly, let's pray for tradition. Let's pray for the Roman pontiff. Let's pray for the March for Life tomorrow. And uh, I want to say God bless everybody. Sh uh, send me all your questions. We try to make videos in response to all the questions and as much as possible. This, this apostolate is for Catholics in the crisis. This is what we're here for. Um, so thanks so much for watching. So let's pray for all these intentions. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.